In the mid-1970s, two members of the United States Army met whilst they were stationed in California. They were Donald Ochi and Vicky Felton, and before anyone knew it, the two of them were married. By 1979, they'd started their own family together when their child was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, a blonde-haired, green-eyed baby girl. Lee Marine Ochi was that first step of what would have been a bright and happy family life together for the Ochis, but unfortunately it wasn't meant to be. In 1981, just two years after Lee was born, Donald and Vicky filed for divorce and parted ways. Vicky left the army, but Donald stayed. He also stayed in constant contact with Vicky, and especially his daughter, and when he was stationed in Germany, Lee would often go out to visit him there. But by 1992, things had settled down a bit more, and the family were closer together. Donald was back in the United States and had moved to Virginia, and by then, Vicky and Lee had been living in Tupelo, Mississippi for quite some time. Vicky had found work at a manufacturing company, and Lee had turned into a fun-loving 13-year-old who spent a lot of time riding horses and looking after them at the local stables. But the summer of 1992 was marked by dangerous times. Hurricane Andrew threatened many cities and states across America, and Tupelo was no exception. Those at the Ochi household tried to carry on as normal, with the weight of the storm front weighing over them, but to what must have been to their relief, it looked like Hurricane Andrew would mainly pass them by. On August 27th, Vicky made the call to go into work that day, leaving Lee on her own in the house unsupervised for the very first time. It wasn't going to be for long. Vicky's parents were dropping by later that day to pick her up and take her on an open day at a middle school Lee was thinking of attending in the fall, but things quickly took a turn. When Vicky arrived at work a little after 8am, news about a severe rain front heading their way came in and she called home to check in. She wanted to make sure that Lee was okay and that she stayed safe until Vicky's parents arrived later that day, but rather oddly, Lee didn't answer the phone. This didn't sit well with Vicky, and the thought of leaving Lee on her own in a severe weather storm got the better of her. Only about 20 or 30 minutes later after Vicky had left home, she was on her way back to check in on her daughter. When Vicky pulled up the driveway to their home, she immediately noticed something strange. The garage door was open and the light inside it was on, something that was incredibly unusual, seeing as Vicky was the only one in the household to drive and she knew that the door had been locked and closed when she had left the house less than an hour before. But what could have possibly happened in a mere 60 minutes? Most of us would automatically assume not much, but when Vicky went into her home that morning, she got a totally different answer. The first thing she saw was a strip of blood smeared into the wall, and her heart sank. In her own words, she then, quote, started calling for Lee and going through all the rooms. Then I went into her bedroom, her favourite blanket was crumpled up on the floor, and I was very scared. When she realised that Lee wasn't anywhere in the house, Vicky contacted the police, the call coming in at around 9am, about an hour after Vicky had first tried to contact Lee. Law enforcement rushed to the scene, finding trails of blood throughout the house and pools of blood in Lee's bedroom, but very little else. The house showed no signs of forced entry, and blood evidence found in the bathroom indicated that Lee's assailant had attempted to clean up the scene before leaving. 
But where had they gone, and where had they taken Lee? A team of bloodhounds scoured the house and the area, but once they made it to the driveway of the home, they lost track of Lee's scent. It is possible that this meant that the assailant had forced Lee into their car and had driven her away, but it was also possible that the rain front that had swept in had simply washed away Lee's trail. With very little else to work with, law enforcement pulled apart the crime scene. They found Lee's nightgown, strangely enough, in the dirty laundry basket. Blood spatter left on the dress suggested that Lee had been wearing it when she'd been attacked, and either her throat or her face had been cut. It was difficult to say more than that, or even how severe the cut had been, only that the way the blood had fallen onto her clothes suggested that the wound had been inflicted above the neckline of her dress. According to Vicky, several of Lee's items were also missing from the home, including a fresh set of clothes, her shoes, her glasses and a sleeping bag. But did that mean that Lee was alive when she left the house that day? Donald, her father, doesn't think so. He believes that his daughter was already dead by the time Vicky called him to tell him that she was missing. According to Donald, Vicky didn't even tell him about the blood that had been found at the scene until days had passed, pretty much on the day that he arrived in Tupelo to help with the searches himself. In a later interview with the press, he said, quote, My theory is that some bastard beat that child to death in that house. And if the local rumours were anything to go by, Donald knew who the culprit was. Up until very recently, Vicky had been married to a man named Barney Yarborough, but she had only just left him when Lee suddenly went missing. Locals pointed the finger at both Barney and Vicky, many of them saying that Barney had been physically abusing Lee, and possibly more than that. Donald claimed several locals approached him, telling him to take the claims of abuse very seriously, and even quoting a time when Lee had reportedly shown up to school covered in bruises. The investigators also looked into the incident of Lee and her bruises, but they uncovered another version of events where Lee claimed to have gotten the bruises whilst horseback riding. They still asked Barney to come in for questioning, and he was able to give them an incredibly solid alibi. Whether it would stand up in court or not, he also passed a polygraph test and was ultimately dropped as a potential suspect in Lee's disappearance. But if Barney hadn't taken Lee, or harmed her, was it still possible that Vicky had something to do with her daughter's disappearance? Suspicions towards Vicky grew weaker when on September 9th, a package addressed to Barney arrived at the household and inside it was something that seemed to bring the investigators both closer and somehow further away to finding Lee. Inside the package were Lee's glasses, giving everyone hope that Lee was still alive and that they would find her, but whoever had packaged this particular parcel had been very careful. There were no traces of DNA anywhere on the envelope, including the stamp which had been dampened with water and not licked before it had been put on the parcel. And then the package only made Lee's case even more confusing. There was no note, no mention of a ransom, or any information on how to contact the person who had sent her glasses. And almost unbelievably, this package turned into a huge dead end. No one could even say for sure if Lee was still alive, or if this package had been the kidnapper's way of saying that she was dead. And with that, Lee's case came to a screeching halt. That was until November 9th of 1993, just over a year after Lee Yoche had disappeared. 
A farmer tilling a soybean field in Monroe County uncovered a human skull and a heartbreaking connection was made. Dental records seemingly confirmed that the skull belonged to Lee Oche and her case went from being a kidnapping to a murder. That was until several days later when the records were checked again and Lee's case took another unbelievable twist. The first identification had been a mistake. The skull didn't belong to Lee, but to a woman called Pollyanna Sue Keith, who'd gone missing a year prior. So if Lee wasn't in that field, then where was she? Suspicions came around full circle and Vicky found herself back in the hot seat. Both local law enforcement and the FBI wanted to know why she had decided to go back home after only being in the office for just a few minutes and Vicky couldn't give them a good enough answer to have herself officially removed from being a person of interest in this case. She also failed three lie detector tests conducted by local law enforcement and the FBI. Donald hasn't come out to say that he believes that Vicky is directly responsible for Leoche's disappearance, but he did say in an interview with the press that he believes that she knows more. When talking about the investigation, he said, quote, I had my concerns. I don't think they had dealt with someone with Vicky's intelligence before. She was a trained interrogator. She knew how to act regarding questioning. Donald based his opinion on Vicky's extensive training as an interrogator for the US Army and that he doesn't believe that there would have been enough time between Vicky arriving at work and then coming back home for the kidnapper to do everything that they did in the house without getting caught. Donald believes that it is far more likely that Lee died the night before and that the following day was spent framing an inaccurate timeline to throw the investigators off the perpetrator's scent. Vicky, of course, denies any involvement in her daughter's disappearance. Instead, she pointed the finger at someone else very closely tied to Lee and her family and Vicky does make a few good points. Oscar McKinley Cairns, otherwise known as Mike, was a teacher at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, where both Vicky and Lee went to every Sunday. He also had horses in the same stables that Lee frequented, and allegedly asked Lee to go out riding with him a couple of times. But why would any of that make Vicky suspicious about him, aside from him asking a young girl to go out with him on her own? Only nine months after Lee had disappeared, Mike kidnapped a teenage girl around the same age as Lee from the very same church that they all attended. He then took her out to Memphis, Tennessee, where he sexually assaulted her. He did bring her back home, which is how he was actually caught, but there is unfortunately more to the story. Vicky accused Mike of kidnapping Lee She said because there had been no signs of forced entry at the Ochi home, Lee would have been more than happy to allow someone she knew into the home. She knew Mike. But the truth is, there was little to no physical evidence to tie him to the crime scene. He was only charged with the kidnapping and assault of the other teenage girl. He was sentenced to eight years in prison, but he only got four only to strike again. In 1999, he attacked a married couple where he assaulted and sexually assaulted the woman in front of her partner, and he was caught once again. This time he was sentenced to 20 years behind bars, but during that time he refused to speak with the investigators and the FBI about Lee Oche or anything regarding her case. If he really did know anything about it, it will unfortunately be very difficult to tie anything to him now. He died in 2021, maybe having nothing to do with Lee or her disappearance, maybe being the only one responsible for it. 
and taking his secrets with him to the grave. Mm-hmm.